Welcome back to the Misdiagnosed Podcast. I'm your host, Caitlin Pyle. It's been a little bit of a stressful week, but that's okay. I'm coming back to myself and recognizing the source of that stress is often just what I'm thinking about. And so many of us don't think about what we're thinking about. We let life happen to us instead of us happening to life. And we don't realize that our thoughts are creating our reality. So that means if we think we're in a bad mood, if we think we have mental illness for life, (laughs) then it's true. And I've been posting a TikTok every day, just trying to be consistent. I've created a lot of content and even cut some pieces from this podcast for TikTok. So far, I think the two pieces that I've posted have done quite well. People like hearing about the real causes of mental illness. Emotional trauma can injure the brain and cause brain tissue heart which can lead to mental illness symptoms, but psychiatrists aren't going to tell you that. It's a topic that hits close to home for a lot of people because many of us are experiencing emotional turmoil and trauma and and an, an increasing number of cases abuse, which is increasing stress in our bodies, increasing stress and injury to our brain. If we have toxic heavy metals in our brains, which we all do, but if those toxic heavy metals are in the emotional center of the brain, that's when you end up with the classic mental illness symptoms. Plus, because the amount of stress that's in our bodies actually lowers the immune system, it can increase our risk by a lot to develop these chronic illnesses and autoimmune illnesses because it allows viruses to invade and replicate at a much higher rate without that strength of the immune system. It's all connected. Our bodies are intricate machines that are integrated systems. So one part is not separate from the other. Your brain, which controls everything, is certainly not separate from your liver. It's certainly not separate from your gut (laughs) and people are talking about the gut brain connection and they're right everything's connected to the brain everything's connected to everything else in fact when your adrenal glands are overworked and overtaxed usually by just getting blown out by adrenaline by overuse of caffeine and stimulants other organ systems like your pancreas your liver your endocrine system including your pituitary gland all jump in to assist but then what happens is they all end up getting overworked and that's when you end up with multiple chronic illnesses The medical establishment has given clever names to all of these forms of inflammation. Encephalitis, thyroiditis, hepatitis, all these itises are simply names for inflammation. They're giving you a diagnosis, a nice happy little label, but just knowing the name of it is not giving you any real answers. It's just an illusion. So that's why I'm doing this podcast, to give you some answers about the real causes of all this inflammation in our bodies. It's viruses, it's toxic heavy metals, it's bacteria over growth. All this stuff that gets into our brains, it gets into our bodies, and surprise, when that kind of crap gets into our bodies, it's not going to work properly. It just makes logical sense, doesn't it? But the medical establishment isn't going to tell you that, not readily anyway, because if you know the reason that you're having these problems, you wouldn't need to go to them, because the cure, the remedy for getting toxins out of the body is to detoxify. First, figure out how you're getting those toxins into your body. Is it through household fragrances? Is it through your cleaning products? Is it simply breathing the air? outside because there's pesticides getting sprayed everywhere. It could be inherited toxic heavy metals, inherited viruses from your parents they didn't even know they had when they had you. All these sources of invaders that are causing problems in our bodies, building colonies in our bodies that we're not aware of because blood testing doesn't pick up infection inside our organ systems. Blood testing only picks up infection in the bloodstream. What happens when that infection, that virus, that parasite, whatever, leaves the bloodstream and starts making a home inside your thyroid. They're not going to biopsy your thyroid at the endocrinologist. They're not. And they're certainly not going to biopsy your brain at the psychiatrist. (laughs) It's so funny. Psychiatry is the only medical profession that virtually never looks at the brain, which is the organ it's supposed to treat. (laughs) They're going in blind, you guys. I get all kinds of comments on my TikTok from people who are like, this information is so dangerous. It's misinformation. People need their meds. Good for you if you were able to manage without meds but I can't. And it's just like so much victim mindset. People don't realize how disempowering it is to rely on a drug. And they don't realize the power that they've given away to these doctors for telling them that a medication is the only way. They're not giving them an option to find the cause of their symptoms so they can remedy that cause and cause the symptoms to go away. It is absolutely possible. I'm living, breathing proof that you can heal mental illness. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder 
or six times. I was diagnosed with OCD, ADHD, panic disorder, PTSD, anxiety disorder, clinical depression, and of course, bipolar disorder six times, all three types, right? But now they're changing it into a spectrum. They're widening the threshold so more people can get diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And nobody's bipolar symptoms are the same. Just like nobody's depression symptoms are the same. Nobody's body, nobody's brain is the same. So these one size fits all, even if there's dozens of different SSRIs, dozens of different antipsychotics. I don't know if there's dozens, but none of them are going to be a perfect fit for anyone's brain. First, because our brains are organic and a synthetic chemical is just going to coat your neurons and lessen your symptoms, but not obliterate the cause of those symptoms. It's just covering it up. And that's the fraud of psychiatry. They're not actually helping. They're just covering up. These pills are a multi-billion dollar industry. More people spend money on antipsychotic drugs than they do antidepressants, by the way. The United States is like 4% of the population, but 70 five percent of our prescription drugs are taken in the United States. It's not pretty. People don't realize how the drugs are not actually helping. More and more people are getting diagnosed with these illnesses. They're not getting to the root cause. They're not sharing information with patients to help them understand why they have the symptoms. They're just being told it's genetic when in fact it's actually the toxins that can be passed on through the generations doctors are confused, right? Our bodies are not confused. Your genes are not bad, but the toxins can be passed from parent to child. So something your grandparents had may have been passed down to you, not in your genes, but through the bloodstream. Yeah. So I think we're going to finish chapter five in Brain Saver today. I hope you're following along. If you're not following me on TikTok, you're missing out. It's great fun over there. I've got over 3,000 followers now on TikTok. Hey guys, I hope you're listening. Give me a shout out. Send me an email drop me a line, send me a DM, whatever you want to do. I want to hear from you about how this show is helping you. If it has, maybe what you'd like to hear on the show upcoming, because I can skip around this book, you know, and I'm going to be doing some interviews as well on the show to kind of break things up because we have like had five weeks in a row now where we're talking about the emotional brain, which it's a huge topic and it's been really interesting and it's great to be able to build on it. But ultimately, I want to be able to do whatever I want with the show, right? I'm not getting paid for it. I'm doing it because I love it and it's fun and it's something that is helping me learn and embody the information. Yeah, on the last episode, we talked about how emotional injuries can damage the brain and cause hardening of the brain tissue. And emotional injuries can be repeated in an area of the brain that can essentially get electrocuted by all that stimulation. So that means when you go through a breakup, and this is going to hit close to home for me because I got divorced and that's when all these so-called mental illness things started to happen, right? You can't make this up. (laughs) I'm reading about myself in these pages here. There's a tremendous amount of heat and I can remember feeling my brain hot and yes, I was vaping a lot of cannabis at the time. I can remember like feeling like in the center of my forehead, I could just feel the heat in my brain. And of course, in that psychotic state, (laughs) I was like thinking something supernatural happening, right? Because you just feel like you're in a completely different world and it's just pretty wild. But that's what psychosis can do to you. And it has to do with heat as well, the toxins in your brain. There is a section somewhere in this book about psychosis. I'm going to look it up since we're here. The medical establishment doesn't have a lot of answers about psychosis. So if you're not on drugs (laughs) like I was, And it could be prescribed pharmaceuticals, right? There's people who have SSRIs that go into psychosis because of being on SSRIs. And like I experienced with cannabis, it can instigate psychosis. But there's another explanation for psychosis, and that's a developing illness inside the brain. One example that Anthony gives in the book is an interaction between toxic heavy metals and solvents. So solvents like in cleaning products as an example. Solvents can get deep inside the brain and touch the toxic heavy metals there and create chemical reactions. Psychosis doesn't normally happen as one big acute severe attack out of nowhere. It's usually a buildup over the years of smaller bouts of psychosis that slowly worsen and lead to larger bouts. It usually takes three or more toxic heavy metals residing deep inside the brain to set the stage for psychosis and then the right combination of the chemical solvents entering the scene to cause a reaction. So an example is imagine a chemist in a lab that's playing around with different metals, dropping different chemical substances on them and then monitoring what kind of reactions occur. Think about that happening inside your brain. Cannabis often triggers psychosis and what determines the level of psychosis depends on how the cannabis has been grown and what chemicals were sprayed on the cannabis or used in the soil. Many chemical solvents are used in growing cannabis. I didn't know that when I was buying all those vape pens (laughs) and of course they're not going to tell you at the store. 
Pharmaceuticals can worsen psychosis, and many pharmaceuticals can create an acute episode of psychosis. Adrenaline is often part of the equation too, so if you're drinking a lot of caffeine while you're smoking weed, (laughs) it's a bad combination. When you're experiencing a bout of psychosis, that results in adrenaline saturating the brain because cannabis creates a sort of crisis in the brain. So all that adrenaline saturates your brain, causing a fight or flight reaction and increases the psychosis. And then the adrenaline with the toxic heavy metals and solvents that are deep inside the brain ignite the whole electrical grid inside the brain and it can keep the psychosis going and going. And then there's mild psychosis where you have lower levels of metal and solvents in the brain, but that can even occur for someone who's been chronically ill and stuck in bed for a really long time. That's actually perfectly normal, acceptable. You should never be shamed for developing emotional issues while you've been chronically ill. It's totally normal to develop some depression if you've been chronically ill for a long time. Any kind of illness or disruption in our physical life can create psychosis. So imagine the news of, you know, finding out your husband's leaving you and you thought he was never going to leave you, you know, (laughs) even though he was seeing someone else, you somehow deluded yourself into thinking he was going to stay. And then no, like your whole life just turns upside down overnight and your body knows it before your mind will allow it. But experiencing chronic illness can also be a sign of constant viral infections. It can lead to a lot of viral waste and viral die off that sends poisonous stuff into your body systems, which then saturates the brain. Ammonia is present in the brain because of a sick liver causing weakened digestion. So you have a lot of people with digestive problems have a weakened liver. If you're not feeling validated, you're not living the life you want to live, this could also create mild psychosis in anyone. It's actually a completely sane psychosis. You might find yourself in a relationship that is on again, off again, and it could be an abusive cycle. It leads to a pattern developing where there's neurons in the emotional center of the brain that are getting shocked over and over again. So the same pattern of emotions and injury are happening in the brain. When a pattern like this develops, neurotransmitter hormones in the emotional centers of the brain start to gather information that another shock could be coming. And that's where you end up with things like PTSD. It's basically making you hypersensitive or even allergic to basically the fear of the next breakup or cheat or abuse that's coming. And that can cause additional emotional responses and additional pain. And it can also vary in severity depending on how much your brain is lacking in nutrition and what you remember from having past issues, other breakups, you know, all of that's connected. You actually have repeated emotional and physical brain injury and injured neurons in the emotional center of the brain are receiving messages from neurotransmitter hormone chemicals as they're trying to send a forewarning because they want to stop the situation. And you learn your tolerance in that way. It's like an allergic reaction. It escalates and it peaks to a point where you feel if you don't change your course, you know some serious damage is going to occur and something's going to go wrong and you're at your limit. And that might be the time when you decide to leave the relationship before too much damage gets done in the emotional centers of the brain. Yeah. And there's something called emotional strokes. When you're lacking in the brain supplies that you need, it's easier to experience a stroke, right? So if our brain environment isn't up to speed, it makes us more vulnerable. People who are most eligible for a stroke, more likely to have a stroke, actually have elevated low-grade viral infections, and they combine that with an imbalance of nutrients, food, and hydration, add in some toxic heavy metals and chemical poisons in the brain and emotional stress, right? It's a perfect recipe for a stroke. It's not like a classic stroke though, the kind in which like blood flow and part of the brain is interrupted in a readily diagnosable way. The combination of factors could set somebody up for an emotional stroke that can't be diagnosed, but where physical injury that's undetectable by MRI and brain scan actually does occur inside the emotional center of the brain, and that's something that can lead to your classic mental illness symptoms. Doctors don't see a physical sign of stroke in the brain, even though it is a physical brain occurrence, so they can still classify your symptoms as an anxiety disorder or any other type of mental disorder, depending on the doctor and what your symptoms are. What are the symptoms of having suffered an emotional emotional stroke. Well, inability to think clearly, panic attacks when someone's talking to you, feeling numb throughout your whole body, fear of communicating with anyone, inability to make decisions, losing sense of time, obsessing that something is wrong that you can't pinpoint, fear of starting anything new, fear of leaving the house, and allergic reactions to stressful situations where something inside makes you feel like you cannot handle the stress. Ooh, I can relate to all of those things. (laughs) 
that's why it's so important to have what you need inside the brain because when you have what you need inside the brain you can get past it because your brain is healing and bouncing back and there's this resilience because you have what you need inside your brain if your brain's not healthy your symptoms could last a long time you could have a, an allergy to stress essentially and it could stay around because the emotional injury was a lot more severe and your brain needs a lot more supplies to protect itself and start healing. So what's going on inside the brain exactly with an emotional stroke? So there's tiny little blood vessels in the emotional center of the brain that get temporarily damaged. Brain tissue bears the brunt of the electrical heat from betrayal, loss, hardship, or any other trauma and become calloused, making the neurons oversensitized, leading to more and more anxiety, right? But I don't want you to freak out. Don't despair. All is not lost because your brain is miraculous and can heal itself when it has what it needs, it will come back and it will heal. Adrenaline, also known as epinephrine, heightens everything going on in the brain electrically. So when we get emotionally challenged on some level, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, like we're in a brand new relationship, you have a new boss or in a friendship with a coworker, maybe you're going on vacation, if you're coming back from vacation, taking time to do something that you love, maybe you want to go skiing, ride a motorcycle, skydive, whatever, adrenaline does play a role and it is fuel on the fire, even if it's a good experience. We're always releasing adrenaline from our adrenal glands. And when that adrenaline touches electricity, it's flammable. Healthy adrenaline actually helps fuel the electrical grid. When it hits the electricity of the brain, it lights up and ignites like fireflies or bugs hitting a bug zapper. And I have a bug zapper on my porch, so it's always getting all the little bugs, especially at nighttime. Adrenaline is a good thing. It's necessary in small, healthy amounts. We actually require it for everyday living and functioning. And it behaves differently from oxygen. Even though adrenaline burns like oxygen inside the body, it does so with more aggression. It's a lot faster. It's more intense. Adrenaline's fire doesn't go out with just water and glucose, although water and staying hydrated is still critical to address brain heat from adrenaline. Adrenaline's like gasoline in your brain. It ignites the electrical grid. So when your brain's on fire and you're adding gasoline, you're just increasing the fire, increasing the heat, and that's how it becomes damaging over time and with intensity. So when that adrenaline sets a fire, when we're going through an emotional experience, it's why we can feel so drained and totally worn out afterwards, and it's hard to function for months sometimes. I went through that with my divorce. I mean, it was so draining on me emotionally. It took me, I would say, the better half of two years to really recover, and I struggled on and off with smoking cannabis because in my mind it was helping me feel better, but it really wasn't. <laughs> I know that now. I'm glad it only took me the time that it did for me to figure it out, though. Some people struggle with cannabis for decades and believe that it's actually helping them and that they need it and they don't realize that they're spellbound by it and they're so dependent on it that they don't know what it's like to function without it and they think something's wrong when they don't have it and they don't re recognize that it's dependency and that the drug actually did it to them and that it's not them at all. They don't know who they are anymore. Yeah, so when that adrenaline pulls away from the electrical grid and the fire kind of goes out, that's when you feel feelings of sadness, you feel depression, exhaustion, and your brain can be elevated. And that's why it can take so long to bounce back from a really severe emotional trauma. Add into maybe your brain is up against acidity, it's deficient, it's got poisons and toxins in it, then it's even harder to recover from that adrenaline surge when you've had an emotional blow. And this is true whether you're young or old. Even though the adrenal glands aren't fully developed until you're an adult, kids can still show extreme emotional reactions, but it's often because of higher levels of toxic heavy metals in the brain and blood sugar crashes from insulin resistance. Kids can have problems like this too, but of course it's getting diagnosed as childhood bipolar disorder instead of looking at the real causes, and that really sucks. I read about the invention of childhood bipolar disorder in The Book of Woe by Gary Greenberg, which I still need to finish. It just got so good and then I went back to the beginning and started highlighting it and I have mentioned it in several episodes because it's so good uh, but he talks about how Joseph Biederman invented childhood bipolar disorder as we get older, when we lack important chemicals that are diminishing in our brains, including glucose and glycogen storage, our brains are actually becoming thick with toxins, toxic heavy metals and fat because we don't know how to combat any of this and we can't recover the way we need to recover. 
So dad, talking to you, it's not just about getting older. It's about your brain and your liver getting full of toxins as you get older. It happens and we can do something about it. (laughs) My dad doesn't like podcasts, so... We do often have more problems as we get older and we have more adrenaline to scorch the brain than we did when we were younger and when we can still recoup easily because as adults, our adrenal glands are fully developed. We don't have the protective control mechanism of the underdeveloped adrenals that children do. So when adrenaline releases, it floods the body, enters the brain, ignites the electrical grid, it can cause a more intense heat to burn, which is really bad if you've got a ton of toxins in the brain. That's why it's so important to start detoxing your brain, eating tons and tons of fruit is the best way to do that. Don't believe any doctor who says that fruit is bad for you. Even if you're diabetic, there's doctors that are starting to put people on fruit, even though they're diabetic, because it's not the same. (laughs) It's not the same. It's incredibly cleansing. So everyday toxins and poisons inside the brain are a giant reason that we experience limitations in our brain, including emotional limitations, right? So if an area of the brain is essentially clouded with a crap ton of poisons and toxins, including toxic heavy metals to solvents, plastic, petrochemicals, pharmaceuticals, air fresheners, fragrances, scented candles and more, that area of the brain that's clouded with brain materials can go into sleep mode, essentially. It doesn't mean that we're actually sleeping. It means that an area of our brain is not functioning optimally. And if you can imagine, if part of your brain isn't functioning optimally, wouldn't it make sense that you'd have mental illness symptoms? If part of your brain is not functioning optimally because it's full of toxins and poisons, it's just logical that we experience mental illness symptoms, right? But that doesn't mean we have a chemical imbalance for life that can't be corrected. It doesn't mean that we need to put more chemicals inside our brain to fix it. It means we need to get the toxins and chemicals out of our brains. Duh. Yeah, and when emotional centers of the brain become filled up and clouded with all those poisons and toxins, we start to become more reliant on other parts of the brain. And as a result of that, we can become limited in our emotional understanding of other people. We can become limited in getting in touch with our own emotional state. We can become limited in feeling and expressing emotion and limited in harnessing emotions. Doesn't that sound like mental illness symptoms? (laughs) Toxins and poisons clogging the emotional centers of our brain can mean that we become extremely emotional without understanding why, leading to diagnoses like bipolar disorder. It makes so much sense that toxins and poisons being in our brains, which is completely logical in the environment that we live in today when there's toxins and poisons everywhere, including the food we eat, that it would be causing symptoms the way it does. Yet we're the ones who are blamed. And the truth is, everybody wants to heal. Nobody doesn't want to heal. Nobody wants to be sick emotionally. Nobody wants to have mental illness symptoms. No one's afraid of healing. No one has a fear of healing that's secretly holding them back from getting better. We want to be healthy. But industries take advantage of our trust. It's become like a brainwashing inside of us. There's a mechanism inside of us that wants permission to do harmful things to ourselves. We try to look for answers about why anything that's harmful could be good for us, like psych meds. We want validation, and we can get that from our psychiatrist, that hurting ourselves by taking these medications with very dangerous side effects could actually be good for us. And it can make it seem like self-sabotage is just part of our innate nature, as if we really want to harm ourselves when we really don't. We don't self-sabotage ourselves because we want to make ourselves sick. We self-sabotage because we're taught to self-sabotage. We're taught that side effects are necessary, side effects are normal, side effects are okay. We're conditioned to self-sabotage and we fall prey to the lie that everything is good in moderation, right? Coffee, vinegar, wine, pizza, fried, greasy food. We hear all the time that these things are not good for us, but then we look for someone else to say that it's good for you in moderation. It's because we don't want to face the reality of what we're actually doing to ourselves. We don't want to pay the consequences of osteopenia coming from vinegar, pulling water out of our bodies and organs liver conditions coming from alcohol, adrenal problems coming from caffeine. So it's hard for us to accept that these are the true causes of these conditions. Many of us want to be healthy and live forever and be super strong and have no symptoms, but only under certain conditions. Like, I want to have my dark chocolate and coffee and vinegar and wine and champagne and salt. You can't stop me. You can't tell me I can't. 
it's easy to go and find some health authority that gives the green light for whatever you want to do to yourself, even if that means take your meds forever, despite all the evidence to prove that it's not good for you. It feels good to be validated for doing things that can actually destroy your body. You can convince yourself that your body loves eggs, for example, even though eggs feed viruses. Your body doesn't need chicken eggs. It's just not logical. <laughs> your body doesn't need eggs. And so there's this brainwashing and conditioning that gets woven into the emotional centers of our brain, which can make it really hard to heal mental illness symptoms. But there always comes a time when something clicks and you know innately that it's not good for you. Like people who are hooked on coffee or other sources of caffeine, matcha. I know I was really into yerba mate for a while, right? It's really popular down in South America. I was drinking those energy drinks with yerba mate in it, thinking it was healthy, but it's still caffeine and it still puts strain on the adrenal glands and can lead to burnout in the long term. Even though in the short term, it made me feel good, right? It made me feel more awake and more like I could be present and active and the way I wanted to feel and I was ignoring my body. And so something happens when you just know it's time that you can't do anything to destroy yourself anymore. You don't want to search for any more validation to support something that's actually harming you. Sometimes it's hard to imagine feeling better than you do in this very moment, but if you knew you could feel better than you do now, if you knew you could, wouldn't you want to do anything possible to be able to feel that? And I'm talking about significantly better, not just barely can tell feeling better or just something that is fleeting, right? Or in the case of someone with bipolar disorder or something that you could just say was mania or hypomania, right? We're just, you're just in a good mood and you're like, oh, that's probably just hypomania, right? You can genuinely feel good and be in a good mood naturally. You don't need pills for that. It takes time to heal your brain. It takes time to detox the poisons and toxins that we all accumulate throughout life in this toxic planet that we live on. And when we do that, that's when we can see symptoms of mental illness start to subside. But it takes time and it takes willingness. It takes effort. And sometimes it takes the professional help of a psychiatrist who understands the dangers of psych meds and can help you get off of them in a safe way if you're on them. And it's super empowering to know that your body has that ability to heal itself. It's super empowering to know that when you give your brain the supplies that it needs and you stop giving it the things that are harming it, that it can actually function the way it's intended to function and those mental illness symptoms can go away. I'm living proof of that. That's why I'm so passionate about what I do and say on TikTok and on this podcast because there was a time when I never thought I would feel better. I never thought I would feel as good as I do now. And I'm not at 100%, right? I don't even know how far away from 100% I am, but I'm still on my healing journey. It's been less than eight months since I really started getting serious and took gluten out of my diet, took dairy out of my diet, stopped eating soy products, started eating a lot more fruit, greens, vegetables, potatoes, organic whenever possible, drinking the heavy metal detox smoothie on a regular basis, drinking celery juice every single day. So if you've been misdiagnosed as having a mental illness when in fact you have emotional injury in your brain and your brain needs to detox, it needs to heal itself, you need to focus on what it needs to do that. It needs to be properly hydrated. It needs to have enough oxygen. It needs to have the right nutrients. Keep listening to this podcast. Make sure you've listened to every episode so far if you can. Follow me on TikTok. Send me an email. I've got my email address in the show notes always for every episode so you can reach out to me. I do offer coaching one-on-one on a very limited basis. I do it a couple days a week so it's first come first serve where we start with a 90 minute deep dive on what's going on and if it turns out I can't help you then I will give you a referral to a very trusted psychiatrist that can help you wean off the medication if you're on medication because that's not something I can do. I can't help you get off medication. I can help you find someone who understands how to do it safely. And, you know, I get people on TikTok telling me that they need their meds, that their meds are life-saving, and that it's possible to live a happy and fulfilling life on meds. And those terms are relative, you know, define happy, define fulfilling. You know, when I was popping pills every day, there was nothing truly happy or fulfilling at all. And there's a concept called medication spellbinding, which is the phenomenon that explains why people who are intoxicated, whether it's by psychotropic drugs, like antipsychotics and SSRI, our eyes believe that what they're taking is helping them. But if you take a step back and really look at the big picture and the overall quality of their life, 
you can see the true story, the real story behind it. Yeah. Well, that wraps it up for chapter five, guys. Chapter five is done. It was a long series. It was a fun series, though. I really enjoyed it. I feel like it's super empowering to look at how the emotional centers of the brain can get injured and combining what we learned from previous chapters on heavy metals in the brain and electricity in the brain and how all that can combine to create these electrical fires and storms that can cause mental illness symptoms by injuring our brains. I hope you'll join me in the next episode. We're going to start a new series on cranial nerves. Super interesting. And I'm also planning some interviews. So be on the lookout for that. Things are just cooking over here for the podcast. And we're just getting started in so many ways. So thanks for joining me. And we'll see you in the next episode. Bye.